Today's episode of the No Fun City podcast is brought to you by Quest Trade. There's a new world of investing where the fees are low and you come first. It's time to switch. Head over to questtrade.com to check out do it yourself, self directed investing. Take matters into your own hands, build your own investment portfolio with a self directed account, and save on fees. Make your money work harder. Questrade is Canada's fastest growing online brokerage with over 21 years experience in the Canadian market, $18 billion in assets under administration, and a nine-time winner of the best managed companies in Canada. And you could rest assured knowing that your money is in good hands. They go above and beyond to protect your account with an additional $10 million in private insurance so you know your money is safe. For more information, check out questrade.com. Just use the link in the description below. On to our show. Welcome to the No Fun City Podcast, episode 25. A lot going on in the world, a lot going on with me, a lot going on right here. Uh, it's been a while since we've done an episode, and this keeps happening for me with me for some reason. But um, I like to do the episodes once a month, but sometimes life gets in the way, and uh, you know, we end up getting hogtied and can't really get it done. But uh we lost a member of the no fun city podcast recently and for those of you who uh are maybe new to the podcast or don't know usually with me here is my sidekick and buddy uh lucas who's my four-legged friend and dog but unfortunately lucas passed away right after i think it was like a couple days after we did episode 24 so you will no longer hear his snores in the background or his barks or him hopping on my lap but he's here in spirit, and I popped his photo up here uh, just for today. Uh, shout out to all my friends and everyone who like sent me messages about that. I really appreciate it, and uh, especially my two friends, Mina and Mitra, who sent me uh, this sort of like fo- photo thing with pictures of him, and then also they sent me a bouquet of flowers like the very next day. So that was really nice of them. Um, but yeah, for that fact, and then also a complete career change for me. Um, I kind of had to put the podcast on hiatus followed by getting sick and having a cough because I can't sit here and cough on the podcast so all of those things combined just added to a lot of time Um, but we're here today and that's all that matters and we're here as always with a very special guest but in this case it is a very special guest because this is another guest of mine that I actually went to high school with (laughs) so it's always good to bring back people that uh, we know from blast to the past type of thing so I'm joined today with Daryl Lim Daryl, born and raised in Vancouver, runs Dimensions Art. Is it Dimensions Gallery or is it Dimensions Art Gallery? It can be either or. You know, like technically we are Dimensions Art Gallery. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then on top of that, I've mentioned this in a previous episode as well. Daryl has a podcast, the Buy and Build podcast, correct? Yep, that's right. Yeah. See, last time I said it was the Build and Buy podcast my bad. Um, But he also has a podcast called the Buy and Build Podcast, where he essentially talks to entrepreneurs and people who buy businesses and build them up. That's essentially the the gist of it, correct? Yeah. So like basically how it started the previous year was that we created the podcast because we wanted to learn about, hey, how does it work to buy a business on MicroAcquire? How do you build it up? And in that process, we like communicated and connected with a lot of entrepreneurs around the world and kind of ask them a similar question. And so we learned a lot of stuff from them and we learned a lot about ourselves during that process. Nice. So, but what was it that made you want to start the podcast to begin with? Like for me on my end, I just started doing this for fun. It led from doing other YouTube videos that I was doing recreationally. But over time, I just decided to do a podcast that was hosted on my personal channel. Then I just decided to take it another level and kind of put integrated in its own sort of format and system and YouTube channel and all that jazz. So, so for me, it kind of just happened gradually over time as a fun recreational thing. Uh, but how did you get into podcasting? Like, to so I think, I think for me personally, I've always been, I like to intake that as my medium where I listen to a lot of stuff and get knowledge from. And so it naturally got me curious, like, how does this all work? How do you get a podcast onto something and then deliver it to everyone? And I'm just that type of person who naturally likes to understand and figure stuff out. 
Um, even when I was young, like 13 years old, I tried to figure out how to code a website. It's just how my brain operates. So I thought it was a fun thing to, you know, kind of like you just figure out how it works. And then in that process, I heard about building in public. And that was a big thing that was going on. So I thought, why not combine the two things? Nice. And uh, you're the host co-host, but you do have someone else that you work with on your podcast, correct? Yeah, that's right. So um, my co-host is, his name is Nicholas Scalf. He's from the United States. He was living in San Francisco. He now lives in Colorado. He's actually a developer for Patreon. And nice. so we just like connected in this Slack group with a bunch of like upcoming entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs. And we we just linked up and said, yeah, all right, let's do this together. Nice. So if he lives in the United States, you live in Canada, does that make it difficult to do the podcast together? Because I assume you guys can't exactly meet in one room. So are all your episodes over Zoom or what's going on there? Yeah, literally everything started during the pandemic. So we wouldn't have had anyone come through anyways. And a lot of our entrepreneurs that we interviewed, they're from around the world. So they're from like Silicon Valley. They can be from Australia. Um, we've had some from like um, Europe, New Zealand, just everywhere around the world. So that's what kind of makes it exciting. But I know for you, you've had it in an actual studio before, which is really cool. You know, like that's something that I want to learn a little bit more about. Um, and see if there's something where I could do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I originally, when I started the podcast, I said, I want to do it in house only. I did a couple exception episodes where I did it over zoom. Um, but for the most part, my original plan was we're doing it all in house. Always when the pandemic hit three months went by, I couldn't do an episode. I thought it was just going to come and go, you know, a few, <laughs> a few yeah. months and then we're all good. That clearly didn't happen. It kind of lasts a little longer. So after a few months, I'm like, okay, well, I have no choice. I either got to bail on the podcast or I got to modify my, you know, plan. So I decided to do Zoom episodes. And it's funny because you want to do more in-house episodes. And I actually learned that doing the Zoom episodes were a little more beneficial for me uh, because of the fact, just like you mentioned, you have guests from all over the world. Um, when you have them in house, they have to be in Vancouver. You know what I mean? Yep. They have yep. to be able to get here type of thing. Um, so for me, it kind of allowed a more, I guess, diverse spectrum of people that I could have on the podcast as opposed to just focusing on Vancouver. And although most of my guests are from Vancouver and some of them who are from Vancouver, like yourself, are doing it over a Zoom episode, um, I do like to do them uh, in house where possible. Uh, but yeah, that's just on and off. And that's just something that I'm going to keep going. So you, I ask my guests, I let them know you can come in house or we could do it over zoom. Most people now just prefer to do it over zoom. It's a lot easier. You don't have to leave your house. You know, the only difference is the setup, right? Like I got to get the guests to set up a second camera, but pretty straightforward and easy. Uh, but yeah, I do like the in-house episodes simply because they are a little more personal, like you're yep. face to face, you're sitting in one environment. I do a three pan kind of layout where you really see the room in all angles. Um, and yeah, so I love the in-house episodes, but they are a little more work. They're just a little more work because you have to set up, but then you also got to make sure everything's clean because a random yeah. person's coming to your house. You don't want things to be messy. Um, but yeah, so so that's that's on my end as far as the in-house episodes. Uh, what What I prefer is now the zoom but i still would like to do the in-house episodes are you gonna start doing any in-house episodes anytime soon like do you have anything coming up for that or no um for this particular podcast uh, i'm not sure yet because well i mean if we did do it it wouldn't be in person here in vancouver it would probably be like me and my co-host would go to an event say in austin or something to do with entrepreneurs and then set it up there rather than like people coming to vancouver just because we know like it'll be hard to get guests on who have to fly here and do that. And we don't obviously have the budget to do that sort of thing. So, but uh, the other thing we were thinking of is I'm a part of the Michael Caccioni Foundation board of directors, and they really wanted to get on board of this podcast thing. And they wanted to talk to a lot of families who, you know, have gone through the struggle of cancer uh, with their children. And so they were asking me to try and help figure out how to like best, you know, launch that kind of platform for them. Nice. Actually, for people who don't know, the Michael Caccioni Foundation is a 
cancer research kind of based foundation, right? Or is it, yeah. a, is it more about the research or is it more about helping families? It's a little bit of everything. So like a lot of the money that is donated to the charity, it goes towards um, cancer research, finding the best technologies to cure kids from like uh, all the, the disease that they get. But a lot of people don't know that once a child gets cancer, even if they get cured during that point of time, afterwards, there's lot, there's lots of years where they have to experience like hardship and uh, health problems. So they're trying, this is why we're raising money and trying to build up that foundation is so then those kids don't have to experience that as they grow up. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know you were part of that. Like uh, Michael Caccioni went to high school with, actually, he went to elementary school with me as well. Elementary school uh, high school, maybe not middle school. And he went to high school with you, obviously, Daryl, like, you know, this, yeah, like, that, that's how you, you knew him. Unfortunately, uh, Michael passed away when we were in high school uh, of cancer. And, uh, you know, he was really well known, like in school, everyone loved him. Uh, he wasn't always around because of obviously, he was sick. But then also, he kind of had a bit of fame going on too, right? Like, he was on a show, I, for, I forget the name of the show, but it was like a boy band type show I together totally forget is that what it was called yeah together yeah and his I remember his character name was QT like yeah. and he was like the cute one quote unquote yeah, yeah so I remember that and uh totally awesome character totally awesome uh dude and you know sadly missed for sure but it's great that you're taking part in that I didn't know that people who knew him personally in high school are actually taking part in the in the actual yeah. charity side of things so that's really cool to hear yeah, so that actually came about kind of recently. So last year, I helped them with some marketing initiatives through online advertising. And um, it's funny, you just mentioned you went to elementary school. That means that we went to elementary school we together. To elementary school together. <laughs> well, wait, because here's the thing, though. See, Michael was at Panorama Heights for a little while. Then I think he transferred to another. I'm not sure. Maybe oh, I'm wrong. Okay, yeah. Did that's he transfer afterwards. to like Bramble? pine tree pine tree elementary oh yeah yeah, yeah. that's right because pine tree opened and then a bunch of people from our school just ended up there yeah. yeah okay i remember that yeah so you were at pine tree you weren't ever yeah. at panorama though no i wasn't yeah okay there you go that, that's the difference so we were in elementary school with michael but in, in different positions yeah 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 that's cool um yeah i didn't know that that's insane so what are some of the new initiatives that that charity is coming out with right now that you are helping them with outside of like the marketing? Is there anything uh, coming up now that you might want to share with the people that, you know, maybe an event or anything? Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, like since the pandemic, we've had to move a lot of stuff online. So now we're trying to put all those initiatives that we had online into in person. So we have we have a lot of annual things that we have going on. So right now, um, we have a kick for a cure. It happens at town center in Coquillum. Um, we're working together with the Vancouver white caps on that as well. And we get like some of the local food trucks to come by. Um, that's always great to have. There's a beer garden in there as well. And then we have our annual, uh, gala event that occurs every year. There's auctions that go down, um, a nice dinner at the Italian cultural center. There's lots of fun stuff, uh, and also a golf tournament. So there's a few different things that are going on. Uh, we're working on some new stuff that I can't really talk about yet, but yeah, things are in motion. Uh, and especially with all these restrictions that are coming down, that helps a lot. Nice. And if people want more information about this, where could they go? Uh, they can go to the Michael Cuccioni Foundation website. We have everything that's updated there. I can send you a link afterwards and you can post it up in the notes. And um, yeah, all the info will, info will be there. Yeah, definitely. So in the podcast, if you are, you know, if you ever follow the podcast, we do it in video format as well as audio. All the links to everything that Daryl talks about here and all my other guests talk about is always in the description of the video. I cannot do it for the audio. But I put slides like you see them. If you watch the video, you also see uh, the slides of things that we're talking about or mentioning. So uh, if you are interested in anything that Daryl talks about today, you can go to the YouTube video and check out the video description and you can find all the links there. Um, otherwise, you just listen and, and you, you jot it down. <laughs> um, OK, so beyond what's going on with the Michael Caccioni Foundation, let's talk about um, dimensions for a little bit. 
because this is something that's really interesting to me because first of all I didn't know you were very into for example art and you know galleries and and things like that so when I found out that you were part of dimensions it kind of threw me a curveball because I didn't even I mean you and I weren't best friends or anything but I know a little bit about my Facebook friends and people I went to high school with so I didn't even know you were part of dimensions so for people who might not know what Dimensions is, you want to give a bit of a blurb about what is Dimensions Art Gallery or Gallery? Sure. Yeah, no problem. So Dimensions Art Gallery is the thir- first 3D painted illusion gallery that's in Canada. Uh, it also has some physical illusions as well, where you can like be sideways in a room, look like you're in a mirror with somebody else. Uh, you can look uh, like a giant or a miniature. And so... The idea is that it's just like a fun gallery in which you can post Instagram, Facebook, social media posts on there and just have a little bit of fun. And the idea actually came up because I went to LA and I went overseas and I saw that some of these galleries existed and they were a lot of fun and they're great pictures and people would always send you messages afterwards like, oh, this is cool. Like, how did you even do that picture? And so one of my best friends, his name is Dio Barro. He's, um, we've always talked about building a business together because he's naturally an entrepreneur himself. He has his own rebar business. He built the first, uh, American Ninja warrior gym here in Canada. And, um, he kind of recently sold those businesses off and we decided we were going to work together on a business. And this, this is how it came about. Nice. And I saw on the website for dimensions that you could actually be part of a franchise for dimensions. If, if anybody is interested, correct? Yeah, so right now we're the first in Vancouver and first in Canada. There are like similar type of styles, but no one else has done the painted art gallery. We've had um, a few people around the world who've actually asked us about our gallery and franchising it from Malaysia to Australia, um, LA, like a bunch of different places. It just hasn't panned out. So, you know, there's definitely interest around the world for this type of thing. Mm -hmm. So one question that I had was like, okay, I go to dimensions. I have a great time, right? How often do those galleries change though? Because I'm assuming that the gallery doesn't change month by month or every three months, or maybe it doesn't change at all. Right. So what's sort of um, the concept of turnaround or changing up the gallery as you go? Because most art galleries, for example, they bring in an exhibit you know, yeah. or they at least have a exhibit that they swap around in one section and then they've got the standard stuff that they've always had. So with dimensions, it works a little differently because these are kind of more installations and, you know, paint directly on the wall type of thing. Yeah. So it's not something that could be easily removed. And then even if you wanted to remove it, do you actually want to remove it? Because it's so nice on the wall. So how do you go about, I guess, rotating on that to make sure that new people are coming, but also that people who have come to dimensions before are going to come back and get a new experience? So I think that's a great question. Um, So that's something that we've internally kind of talked about quite a bit. And given the situation with the pandemic, um, you know, I think first you have to do a little bit of market research and determine, okay, how many people do we have here in the lower mainland or in the greater Vancouver area? Okay. And how many customers do we have? And how many more potential people could be coming in? And you kind of look at those statistics and determine like, okay, do we need to make that change yet? So like, it, it's not that we don't want to make that change. It is inevitable that we actually have to do that change. And we are in the process of making that change. But we've been, because of the situation, people haven't been really traveling a lot. So we've been able to leave these installations up for about the last year and a half and it's been okay we haven't really got a lot of inquiries saying hey like we want to come back again and make this change but we've slowly been getting that through a lot of the comments through our social media posts through our ads and stuff so we've we've now decided okay you know we got to start making those changes and we've done about half of them now we're starting to do the other half slowly as well and we hope to get them up by like april or may now Nice. Just in time for, I guess, like summer and any possible tourism that may even happen of bringing people from around the world to Vancouver to give them something to do as well. Um, but how has the, how have things been for Dimensions over the pandemic? Because obviously there was a 
and a few maybe periods of time where social distancing was in place. People weren't exactly going to galleries or group areas where, you know, they're mingling in public in small yes. spaces. So how was uh, Dimensions affected by all of this? I think the key here is if anyone is out there trying to start their own business, it's always pivoting to the situation that you're in. So with our situation that we were in, we knew there's a pandemic. You weren't allowed a lot of people into certain areas. It's how do you adapt to those rules and that situation? So the best that we adapt to that situation was, okay, we know that we should probably do booking in advance. If we do booking in advance, that ensures we know how many people are there in advance. Secondly, if we put like a limit to how many people can actually be in the gallery at the same time, and based on our judgment, how much space we can give people, that will make people feel comfortable and want to come through. And then one of the sides uh, in terms of marketing, I know you're like a marketing guy, is that, you know, I've, I've worked with tons of businesses and they kind of always overlook marketing. We didn't stop that marketing push. We did it the whole time. And we knew that we needed to get in front of people. Even if some people were afraid to go out, we needed to have those people who weren't afraid to go out, know about our brand and want to come in and kind of enjoy themselves during this, you know, situation. Yeah. It's, it was definitely like hard on, various types of small businesses you mm-hmm. know like whether it's a restaurant whatever even my uh personal um you know freelance business suffered uh in the last year of the pandemic uh i was fortunate enough to like be able to endure it um but yeah i i felt for things like art galleries because it seems like already it might be tough to get people in the door at any gallery maybe besides like the major art galleries that you'd go to like the Vancouver art gallery or whatever. But I always thought I'm like, man, all these smaller galleries, they're going to have a tough time getting people a in the doors if they even can. And then b like the monetization is going to be so much lower because of the pandemic. So I wonder, was there any government uh, help towards like the art side of things? Cause I know for musicians, for example, we had Dallas Roden, um, on the podcast episode 19 i believe maybe maybe episode 18 um and she was talking about how there was absolutely no help for musicians and she she had to cancel a bunch of her shows and she had to work her way around the pandemic so when it can't, comes to like art galleries was there any help there at all from the government so there's a strange thing with like business licenses and what you technically are and you aren't uh an art gallery is technically considered retail so okay. it is, whereas a museum is considered something completely different. Oh, wow. And so we actually rented a space that was considered retail and it could only allow for retail. So we couldn't even be considered a, we couldn't put a museum there. So we had a gallery there instead. Um, and so we did actually have some relief from the government. We have a great landlord who was willing to work together with us because they got some subsidies from the government as well. And so, yeah, we got a little bit of assistance there, but I would say, again, the key here is that we didn't really stop doing the marketing and, you know, like you said, people are struggling, uh, and, and whatever else, but unless you get the eyeballs on and the attention to your business, you're not going to drive traffic through that door. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's definitely, I guess, like 100%, uh, truth, like just a truth bomb in general. I, I know I had conversations with a few people. <clears throat> excuse me, who, who were kind of telling me otherwise, they're like, no, 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 no. Like the government should be taking care of us like through and through the whole way through. And I'm like, yes and no, you know, there's two sides to this story or not two sides mm-hmm. to the story, but there's two sides to the ball. Like, yes, government assistance. Great. But also, you know, you can't live off government assistance forever. Like the companies and businesses still need to try to do their best to sort of get things moving and get things growing and it looks like that's what you guys did there so what beyond having bringing in the new installations and the new I guess like art pieces and stuff like that what are some of the uh other things that Dimensions is working on uh long term uh long term actually we're thinking about opening other businesses that are kind of related in the entertainment realm 
Um, so, you know, right now, the way that Diment is going is going pretty good. We're pretty consistent. Um, we're pretty close to like capacity a lot of times. Um, like we talked about earlier, we're hoping for tourism to come back, but I think it actually is coming back because um, we saw some a CBC article that talked about tourism and the cruises that are going to be ported soon, almost 300 different cruises. So, you know, we're going to take it at, on the short term, not really the long term right away. But right now we're at a good point where we are thinking about opening another business. Nice. So that it's interesting because uh, it seems like, OK, you guys got consistent flow coming in as far as patrons coming in and, and checking out Dimensions. Do you think part of that is because other forms of entertainment were shut down? For example, the movie theaters kept opening and getting shut down and limitations, uh, concerts, venues, things like that weren't around. So do you think uh, people were generally looking for a different outlet, which allowed you uh, to sort of, you know, get an influx, for example, of uh, patrons or members? Uh, so I wonder, like, did you see that also go up for you guys based on the fact that all these other entertainment and establishments and restaurants and things like that were kind of shut down for a while? Or do you think that this was just something that was always steady pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and even on to now? No, there's always ebbs and flows with whatever situation it is. So um, when we first opened up, it was just like that big craze, like, oh, wow, you know, this new thing opened up. I'm, I need to check it out. And I would say, yeah, there's definitely things that were shut down that would benefit us in that circumstance as well. And then, you know, yeah, I think it really just goes along with the months or the seasons of the year. So yeah, if things start opening up, for instance, when Bonnie Henry announced a couple of weeks ago, hey, you know, things are opening up, we're going to release, let ease on restrictions. Like we blew up, like it was at capacity and we had one of our best like weekends and there's definitely an effect on it. So it, it, it definitely depends on the circumstance. But as things were slowly getting eased anyways, um, I think it was just natural that, you know, people were going to come. But in terms of if it really dramatically helped us or not, based on other industries closing, I, I think it didn't actually, because, you know, once that initial hype went away and say restaurants were closed or something that was not a benefit to us because we needed those people. Uh, a lot of our demographics is actually families. So we need those families to come out, enjoy other things. And they're like, Oh, this was part of our day. We wanted to come out here and go to a restaurant. We wanted to go to Stanley park. And then we wanted to come to the gallery. So it serves us as a benefit to not just be the only attraction. We want to be like a part of the whole day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of the patrons and coming and visiting and then also marketing aspect, uh, this being an interactive gallery where people sort of go in, they're taking photos on their phones, posting it to social media. That's kind of the gist of the whole thing is you're interacting with these art pieces and you're interacting with these rooms or spaces that you've created. Um, so part of your marketing is also the individual's that come in and post their photos and then some friend on, comments on there, hey, where, like, where's this? Or where, where do you, or they tag you guys or whatever it may be. Uh, do you see a lot of turnaround as far as people coming in saying, oh yeah, I saw this on my friend's Instagram and I had to come check it out or, or anything along those lines? Like, do you find that other people coming in sort of helps uh, increase maybe your presence uh, just based on the fact that they're posting on social media? Oh yeah, for sure. Whenever someone like we always see all the tags that different people do and we say, Hey, tag us if you want to be featured on our page. And we get a lot of people who tag us in those posts. So yeah, you're right. It naturally has that word of mouth anyways. And you know, from the marketing side of things, people always want to find user generated content anyways. And this type of business lends itself to user generated content anyways. Um, I would say, you know, it goes from like that simple family who's coming in and they're taking photos and they're like, Oh, that'd be a great activity with our whole family and our kids. And we could get a family photo here to Michael Buble. He came in and he posted it and actually posted it on his social media and that helped pull it up as well. Mm -hmm. And I saw that photo, uh, the Michael Buble one that you just mentioned. So yeah, it's, it's cool. Do you have any other like famous people that come in outside of Michael Buble? 
Um, we have some actors and actresses that I don't really know, <laughs> but they had quite a few followings from like 150 to like 300,000. But um, no one who's really gone out of their way to be like, hey, like you should go here that we knew of. Mm-hmm. Like Michael Bublé is probably the most famous right now. Yeah. Michael Bublé goes everywhere, though. I've yeah. even seen him at like Coquitlam Center a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That guy is somehow everywhere, you know, and some like even <laughs> Uh, actually a former guest and someone you might know, Richard Forbes. Do you remember yeah. Richard? For- yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard like saw Michael Bublé at uh, the airport in Singapore, I think. Do you know this <laughs> yeah. story? No. Okay, I got to tell you this story because it's actually really cool. So uh, Richard Forbes, former guest on the podcast early on and someone who went to high school with Daryl and myself, uh, lives in, or at least for a while, lived in Asia, would come and go one day he was at the airport in Asia and he sees Michael Bublé and he wasn't going to say anything. Then he's like, no, you know what? Let me like ask him for a photo or something. So he gets his photo and Michael Bublé, it's like the first time I think he was in that area. So Richard just nailed him with a bunch of places to go, things to see, things to do. And Michael's like, oh, I have a concert tomorrow. Uh, I'll put your name on the guest list. If you want to come out, come out, like whatever. So Richard goes and he was like front row at like a Michael <laughs> Blue for free. Like, I was just like, this is crazy. <laughs> so, so it's just interesting things like that that happen. It is just uh, insane. Really nice of Michael to do that. And then also to post about uh, dimensions. But Daryl, here's the next question for you. You got dimensions going. You're doing that, that work, the marketing work with the Michael Caccioni Foundation Charities and God knows what else. But on top of that, you also have your own personal career, like you work outside of that. So you're a man of many, you know, you got a plethora of things going on. What's the next thing that you're going to add to your table? So there is something that I'm working uh, in the background here, and it's just something that I wanted to do for a very long time. It's a D to C e-commerce business. I've been surrounded by a lot of great entrepreneurs who've done really well and um, can't really talk about it too much, but it's in the test works right now. On, just give us a little <laughs> bit of something, just a little, like, what does it tie into? Can what does we... it tie into? There's, um, a little bit of Asian culture that's involved with it. Um, it is a supplement. So it's a blend of two different things. Um, but it's more healthy for you. Nice. I have a feeling yeah. mushrooms are involved. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> <I> not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just thought because there's a lot of like mushroom things that are going on lately. So so I just assumed. Uh that's cool. Cause like here's the thing, like in in a nutshell, you are a bit of an entrepreneur yourself. Like you yeah. do have a job, like you do work outside of all of this, but yeah, mainly like your focus seems to be on creating these other businesses and other avenues, which is something that I'm a huge fan of. Um, I think, yeah, if if you've got a career and a job, you should still be looking at other businesses and other ways that you could earn or whatever, just better yourself, further your career, whatever it may be. So I always love it when I meet someone who does a little bit of everything, because it really puts it into perspective of what is possible for somebody like you don't have to know, have the answers to everything in everything you write, like you don't have all the answers to everything you do or did right? Like we we could agree, right? And I don't have all the answers to everything that I do. But the fact is that you do them, right? You're not afraid to do them. And you're not afraid to push them. So I'm sure there are people out there, for example, who might want to even start something as simple as a podcast. This is something that I get emails about all the time. I even did an episode, a solo podcast episode, just about this fact, um, just so I could send people that video instead of explaining myself. Um, But what do you, what are some maybe pieces of advice that you'd give to somebody who's maybe looking to reach out to do something on their own, whether it be through sort of maybe an industry that they understand or an industry that they might be new to, but they really are passionate about? What are like some tips and uh, pieces of advice that you'd give for that? So it's great that you bring up this point because I think you know, naturally when I first started, this was six or seven years ago, I had, or even longer than that, eight or nine years ago, you read all these books and you're like getting really into it. I have tons of friends who are like this too. And they go through what's called analysis paralysis. They just overthink everything. And instead of taking action and doing it, they 
yeah, they they're they're just not doing it. Um, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Yes, you're allowed to be yourself. <laughs> I don't. You you're you, hey when I when okay so when I have guests, my whole goal is like this is your time to shine. This is your mic. This is your time to talk. Anything you want to say, you can. I've had guests who have literally like not lied but literally were conspiracy theorying their way <laughs> through the podcast to the point where I was like okay like I'm gonna have to cut some of this stuff out but I let them talk because it's like their opinion it's it's you know their thoughts it's like their world so same goes for you you're allowed to say whatever you want you're allowed to talk whatever within reason you know if you're yeah. gonna be discriminatory against someone or a type of yeah. I can't have that you know but if you're just swearing or just you know, being emotional or whatever that that's, you know, it's, it's your, your mic, your time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the thing that actually put me over the edge and helped me a lot. And I still use it today is I have two words. It says, fuck it. Like it, it just helps me cross that mental barrier where I always am like, Oh, you know, this might cost too much money. This might take too much time. And I say, fuck it. I just, that that's the wording that I use. And an, Anyone who's asked me for consultation on entrepreneurship or, you know, that have roadblocks, I just say, fuck it. So I would say for all those potential entrepreneurs out there who are always trying to think like, how, how do I go about doing this? Should I be pre planning this and overthinking stuff? I would say, well, what's holding you back right now? Well, you know, the money might not be there. I don't have the time. Okay. Well, can you reallocate that time? Do you have maybe two hours in a day at night? where you can focus on your attention on this and make sure you're really focused on it. But yeah, I don't know if I have those two hours. Okay. Say, fuck it. Just do it. You know, because unless you take the action and actually progress, you'll never get to where you want to go to. And I've, this is not to say, you know, dimensions is the first success that I've had. Um, you know, it's taken a lot of time, a lot of failed businesses to get to where I'm I've been to the first business I ever started was again with my best friend, who's my partner at dimensions. We started a clothing business. We spent $10,000 on clothes and it's now sitting in a storage somewhere, you know, but we learned the process of how do we get these clothes? How do we get it embroidered? How do we get it printed? How do we do these graphics? How do we make a Shopify website? How do we go to an expo and set all these things up? And unless you do those things, you never know how is actually going to go about or how all that experience, unless you do it. Um, two things that you said struck a chord with me. Number one, I totally agree that people use time as an excuse. Like, Oh, I don't have the time that number one, it like, uh, is the number one excuse I hear time and money are the two things, right? Or I get home from work. I'm too tired. So I have this rule. It's called the 15 minute rule. I've mentioned this rule many times to people. And every time I've said it, I get a, comment or text back from them. Hey, I've done your 15 minute rule and like it totally works. So my whole thing is if you've got something you got to do, but you don't want to do it or you're procrastinating, do it for 15 minutes. And here's why. Number one, at least you progress for 15 minutes that day minimum. But number two, what usually happens is when you start doing it, 15 minutes is long enough where you could get some work done but short enough where you'll want to get more work done. So your 15 minutes will actually turn into 30 minutes or an hour. So I had a friend who plays guitar, hasn't touched his guitar in a very long time. And he was like, yeah, I haven't picked up my guitars in so long. I want to start like making songs and stuff. It's been forever. And I'm like, dude, I have this rule. It's called the 15 minute rule. Just do it for 15 minutes every day. I promise you'll get into it. And he messaged me like two days later. He's like, dude, I've been doing your 15 minute rule. Both times I went over like an hour of just practicing guitar and stuff. He's like, it, it changed my perspective. And it's just as easy as, you know, sitting there being like, yeah, I, I got 15 minutes I can kill. And once I'm done that, I don't have to continue further. That's the best part about this rule is if you, it's so short that it's not going to kill you and it's not going to take time out of your day. That's long enough where you'll get stuff done and you might actually continue further. So that's uh, my piece of my second piece of advice uh, would, would be to, to kind of add that element to uh, to the mix. If you're having trouble creating something new or you're looking to do something that you just, quote unquote, don't have time for. Um, and yeah, time is just one of those things that becomes a problem. Even I'd mentioned it early on in this podcast, like I 
ran into certain situations that prevented me from having time, but also in a sense, emotionally with my dog, I just wasn't like really there for a week or so. So um, things do get in the way, like life gets in the way, sure. But life only gets in the way to a certain degree. And at a certain point, it's it becomes laziness or procrastination. So kill kick the proca- procrastination somehow or any way that you can. Um, but going back to this t-shirt business, because I mean, I don't know if it quote unquote failed or succeeded, but here's the thing that I think about. I always say like failures are the biggest successes because you learn you you will not learn without these failures. Like, trust me, I've failed in so many different ways, but I've never failed the same way twice as a result of which. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, what's his name? Shit. This guy, he wasn't a teacher of mine, but he was a bit of a mentor. Oh man, his name is slipping my head. Oh, it's going to kill me. It's okay. But he put into perspective for me. He's like, you know, there's things you learn in school. And then he's like, and that's great. You know, you get your BA in your field and then you feel like you know everything, but there's just stuff that you learn in the street, which is like when you're in it, like when you're working at your career or if you're freelancing, like I was like, there were things I learned freelancing that I could not have learned in school, you know, that there was no way that that dynamic would have prepared me for this certain situation. So having this whole idea of having failures as successes the t-shirt company let's go back to that was it a failure that turned into a bit of a success situation or was it successful and you kind of just let it go what happened there so that was the very first business and you're right it's you know technically i call it a failure but there's so many things that i learned out of it and that it's a span off into so yeah, we were able to understand, hey, how do you set this up an expo? How do you set up an online store? How do you get like influencers? At the time, we had local influencers who were wearing our clothes. Um, what it turned into was I created an Amazon store online in the United States. And that was something that I really wanted to get into. So we still had a brand. We could still sell it, but I pivoted into like fitness accessories just so then, you know, I could see what that was like. And I did a decent amount. I think I sold like 35, 4,000 US a month on Amazon. And I would, to me personally, I would still consider that not a success (laughs) because, (laughs) because, you know, I was spending too much money on marketing. I wasn't going at a profit whenever I was doing that. And I just said, all right, I'm done with this. I'm going to stop this for now. I'm going to come back to it later on, which is why, again, I'm starting that new business because I have this thing where when I fail at something, I'm like, okay, I have to figure this out. I need, I, there's something in me burning that says I need to try and figure this out and make it successful. So I would say like the best thing is to like stack different skills that you have over time. And, you know, from all my experience and doing different things from the clothing business, that turned into Amazon selling on Amazon, a few different products. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to try out drop shipping to see how drop shipping is. How does that all work? That actually taught me how to run Facebook ads properly and social media ads. And as a result of that, I, that turned into a freelance business because then there were people asking me, hey, how do I run Facebook and social media ads? And so I was able to generate business out of that. But this news business that I have it's a culmination of stacking all these different skills that I've had for the last six or seven years and actually doing something and taking action. So if I didn't take all of those actions and build up all these skills and all this knowledge, I wouldn't know how to do it. So mm-hmm. I have like an, an unbounced landing page right now. I have a Shopify store. I work with like a supplement company to build formulations, how to communicate with them properly. That's like a logistics thing. You know, I've talked to manufacturers before, um, and then I created Facebook ads and different stuff. And now I'm trying to learn how TikTok works. And so it's literally a combination of all these different things. And unless I tried and failed at all these different things, I wouldn't have known how to do it. So for anyone out there who's always trying to hold themselves back thinking, Hey, I don't want to do this because of this reason or that reason, uh, just do it. You know, like if you really want it, go do it and try it because it will turn into something greater as long as you try. Mm -hmm. And what are, because, you know, you mentioned how you learned about, for example, Facebook ads and and all these other uh, platforms. 
uh, what would you say are some of the best resources for people? So I'm someone new in the world of wanting to start something, whether it's entrepreneurial or business-based or just for fun and recreation. Uh, what are some areas or platforms for resources and references that you would direct someone to uh, in order to learn more about these uh these platforms, but also in order to progress their entrepreneur, uh, whether it be business or uh, recreational idea that they have? I would say the first starting point and the the one that's free is YouTube. Honestly, it sounds crazy, but I learned tons of stuff from YouTube. There's so many people dropping knowledge bombs out there on YouTube. You need to just go out there and learn all this stuff. I've actually paid for premium because I'm sick of the ads that are showing up. And I intake so much YouTube stuff all the time. This is how I learned about cryptocurrency. This is how I learned about TikTok. Um, yeah, that's one of your best resources. If you decide you want to pay for something, you can check out Udemy. Udemy is a great resource where someone is creating a course. You can sign up and I think you get the first course for $19. So just go in there, learn the basics, figure things out and go from there. And then you, you can always go on to Google, read blogs if you're a reader instead of someone who likes to watch videos. Um, tons of resources if you just check out different blogs out there. And on my end, I would recommend Reddit. Like Reddit forums tend yeah. to be pretty good uh, as far as people knowing, uh, you know, like getting information from other people. Uh, it was a great reference for me for the podcast and in some cases for the YouTube channel. Uh, and creating videos, things like that. I think Reddit is a great um, platform for things like that. And obviously YouTube, uh, if I can give one piece of advice to anybody is like, if you're ever watching a long video or like maybe you're listening to an audio, whether it be an audio book or something, uh, I like to save my time. So I've learned to listen to whether it be how-to videos or just instructional videos or guidance, for example, anything regarding research or uh, things of that nature, I listen to the videos or watch the videos at uh, two times speed. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Get it done <laughs> in, in half the time type of thing. Uh, I think that's a really uh, good sort of trick to sort of save time on when you're doing research or watching things. Uh, it's a little difficult at first. You kind of got to go slow, go to like 1.25, 1 1.5, 1 yeah. then up it to two. And once you get to two, it's like speeding through things. And now I use it for everything for my new career. Actually, I'm now like niching down as a content strategist because I create content. And now I just like got pushed into that realm of uh, marketing. I now use it for uh, all the different, um, resources that I have to look through for my new career. Um, and that's been beneficial. Literally I've gone from taking eight hours of resources that I've had to watch videos on and reduced it down to like two or four even. Um, so that's a great help. If you're looking, if you're someone who's looking to save time or you don't have time to always sit down and watch YouTube videos, that is like a key way that you could save time, but still take in the content that you're looking for or the resources and references that you need. Um, that would be uh, my suggestion there. But Daryl, we've been at about an hour. So before I let you go, is there anything else you want to discuss and talk about? Um, I want to ask you a little bit about your printing business. So like, oh, sure. is it just embroidery or is it printing as well? Embroidery and silk screening. So screen printing as well. Yeah, I, I do both, but I have a minimum for screen printing because it's a little more, not messy, but a little more work. So yeah. I usually tell people, I'm like, if you want to do screen printing, you have to do a minimum of a dozen, like a dozen mm -hmm. shirts and anything over that is uh gravy. But I just did for Ram Consulting, uh, which is a huge engineering firm now in uh, downtown Vancouver, we just did a hundred shirts uh, and a hundred embroidered shirts for all of their employees and staff. Um, so we ordered those from Cutter and Buck. And then I just printed them here in the garage, got it done, sent it off. Nice. Are you running any type of ads for it? Uh, no, not really, but it's funny. Cause I just constantly get people, you know what I do? Like I post, uh, stories to Instagram 
Yeah. And then people just see that. And then someone's like, oh, I didn't know you did this. I need like 50 shirts for my company. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I, I got you. Like, send me the file and, and we'll get going on it. Um, or I need hats or whatever. So, and then I got the same people who've like come back to me time and time again after, after doing it a few times. Um, so yeah, so no ads. I kind of just like added it as it's there. If somebody asks for it, you know, I'll, I'll do it. But I don't really run ads for anything like that. I <laughs> think I uh, <laughs> I, there might be a case study that's actually local here that I got to send you. Okay. It, and they, I think they make quite a bit of money from their printing and stuff because they run ads. So, oh yeah, I bet. Yeah. I yeah. Bet. Yeah. It could but be pretty lucrative. The problem with me is that like, especially with my career and then all of this stuff, this goes back to not having time is yeah. that I don't think like if I ran ads and I got a, a huge amount of people requesting this stuff, I would not be able to have the time to do it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a little, I'm in a little tricky spot where I get enough work from it where I could do it on, you know, here, there, I get like one project a month, for example, that, and, you know, I run that and that's fine. If I got five projects in one month and I had to do like a hundred shirts for each, uh, that would be a little tough to do, uh, just based on the time that I spend in my career and then the time that I spend doing other things. But you're right. Like, I mean, I'm sure if I put ads out there, I could definitely sell a lot more. And that might be something that I'll have to like actually contemplate. Because as I said, this was something like my dad just happened to retire. He's like, oh, I'm going to sell all my stuff. I'm like, no, 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 like don't sell it. I'll just take the cool. Like I'll take it. Like, yeah, I'll just take this stuff and I'll, and I'll work on it in my garage, whatever. So he's like, sure. Okay. We'll hold on to it and you can do whatever you want with it. So that's kind of how that came to be. It wasn't like me being like, oh, I'm going to start a shirt company and I'm just going to promote it through my Instagram. But yeah, definitely send me any resources or any ideas you might have in regards to that. I'd be down to push it harder than I do now, as long as it doesn't interfere with anything else. Yeah. Yeah. You've heard of uh, the Printful, right? No. So the Printful is like a print on demand service where it's connected directly to Shopify. It's oh. one of the biggest businesses in the United States. Oh, wow. Yeah. But where I thought there was a hole in the market right now was that there isn't any Canadian based ones. So if you get it from America, you're paying for all the shipping costs from America and you're like, it's, I, I don't know, it's so much money that might not be worth it to me. But if there's one here in Canada, I think there could be a market for it. Okay. I see. Yeah. So, and that's the thing though, right? Like once that takes off, I'm a one man show right who does this yeah. kind of on the side so people are going to complain that they ain't getting their stuff on time <laughs> you know so i would have to literally like go about it in a business plan type of way and and like set it up like a proper business at that point i would think right yeah yeah so so that's the only thing that would be holding me back from there but otherwise you know i know how to do it i love it i can get it done um as long as I have the time for it, I can definitely get it done. But something to that volume might be a little like over, over the amount of time that, that I would have, you know, without getting clients and customers to be upset that they're not getting their stuff on time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're so, overthinking it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. 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 100%. And here, actually, this goes back to your overthinking was that I would overthink with a lot of things, even with the podcast. I think about things because my problem, and I think this is a problem with a lot of overthinkers instead of just doing it is, oh, I got to plan this so that when I launch it, it's as per it's perfect. It's yeah. the professional way it should be. And then I don't have to change anything. I don't have any holes, whatever. So me pre-production planning is huge. Like it takes a long time for me. I like to take my time on it and slowly figure it out. But I realized from doing that, um, I was hindering myself and I was slowing myself down. And that yeah. happened every time I did that. So like you, I'm one of those that mostly like now I'll just do it and I don't need it to be perfect the first time. Yeah. The podcast even is a great example of that, even though I kind of did overthink it. If you look at the early episodes of the podcast and you compare it to the episodes that I do now, a lot has changed and a lot of differences. And even, um, 
the way the podcast runs, my hosting, my speech, I've tried to stop saying like and um a lot. That's mm-hmm. been my, that is the one thing yeah. that is left on my podcast. You got to stop doing this. And it's just one of those things. But, but yeah, I do tend to overthink a lot of things. So maybe I just need your assistance in figuring this out. And uh, yeah, maybe we need to talk. We you need an accountability talk. coach. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what I need. <laughs> accountability and experience, because you got to understand, this is easy for someone like you who's done it before, right? It's a little bit easier for me than someone who's never done it before. But I'm still in the position of like being on this side of the fence as opposed to your side of the fence, right? Like you've created multiple businesses. You've been around the block of that. I've created one freelance business and just added uh, elements to it, right? Mm -hmm. And and different opportunities for my customers. You know, they come to me for branding, but they end up getting shirts, that kind of thing. Uh, So for me, maybe I just got to like branch it out a bit more and um, think of it as its own independent thing and, and push it a little further. So I could definitely agree with you there. Um, I'll have to look into that and then also uh, pick your brain a little bit and see what I can do to move that a little bit without maybe doing so much of the work myself. So yeah, so yeah, we'll have that conversation for sure. I'll, I'll reach out to you uh, later, maybe in the week uh, to discuss. But beyond that, is there anything else that you want to mention to the lovely people out there? before we get going. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for listening. You know, most of the time I'm on the other side of the microphone here and I'm interviewing other people. So I really appreciate the opportunity to like talk about uh, my own experiences with you. And thanks for inviting me on the show. Um, You know, for everyone who was at our high school, Hey, what's up? Having (laughs) hello to everybody. Um, But yeah, you know, I've kind of gone through this path of, just trying everything out, figuring it out. And I think if you've, you're in the same boat as I am with this new trend of starting your own business, it's just about trying things, go out there and do things, go network and connect with the right people because don't get stuck in your own head. You know, when I met a few people who were doing like a hundred thousand a year or 200,000 a year, and then to like a million to 3 million to $10 million that, you know, in entrepreneurship, it kind of changes your mindset and your brain a lot. You don't think, oh, that's undoable. It's, I know someone who's done that and I can do that too. So really for everyone out there, just change your mindset. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you understand everything is achievable. Just go out and start doing things. Where can people catch you if they want to find you on social media and all that? Um, So they can connect with you on like LinkedIn, Facebook, or on uh, Twitter. I also have my own website. It's darylim.co. So I have a website there, but I also have the Buy and Build podcast. Um, so yeah, buybuildpod.com. Nice. Awesome. And as for myself, you can catch the podcast sort of social media at No Fun City Podcast on Instagram. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, follow us there. And then also subscribe to our YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel is fairly new. When I had it on my personal YouTube channel, we had a lot of growth, but my personal YouTube channel has a lot more followers than the podcast does. So please do me a favor, go subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel for the podcast, No Fun City Podcast. Just look it up and you'll be able to find it. Um, and we will catch you guys next time. This is the end of the No Fun City podcast. Peace out. Today's episode of the No Fun City podcast is brought to you by Quest Trade. There's a new world of investing where the fees are low and you come first. It's time to switch. Head over to questtrade.com to check out do-it-yourself self-directed investing. Take matters into your own hands, build your own investment portfolio with a self-directed account and save on fees. Make your money work harder. Quest Trade is Canada's fastest growing online brokerage with over 21 years experience in the Canadian market, $18 billion in assets under administration, and a nine-time winner of the best managed companies in Canada. And you could rest assured knowing that your money is in good hands. They go above and beyond to protect your account with an additional $10 million in private insurance so you know your money is safe. 
For more information, check out questtrade.com. Just use the link in the description below.